I'm Andrew Grossman and this is In the Garden. It's June here in Seekonk and June is all about roses and today I thought I'd show you some of my favorites and give you some tips on growing them. The first one I want you to take a look at is this beautiful old-fashioned rose called Heritage. Now this is a David Austin rose. David Austin is an English rosarian who started breeding what are typically considered English roses because of the shape of the blossom. This is an old English style rose, meaning that as opposed to a tea rose, which is sort of a point that unfurls, these roses start as a point and then they're quartered, so they don't really have a definite center. Now one of the great things about David Austin roses is that A, they're very easy to grow, and B, they're one of the few roses on the market that do reliably rebloom. Now I say that with one little corollary, which is that this is the best bloom of the season. June is by far the best bloom of the season. They do continue to bloom throughout the summer and even up until frost, but the display is not as showy. The flowers tend to be a little smaller and you don't get quite as many of them. Nevertheless, this is a great rose and all the David Austin roses are very easy to grow. As you can see, I've got a lot of garden here and I really don't have time to coddle plants. If a plant isn't hardy, doesn't perform well, needs a lot of spraying or fertilizing or extra care, I simply don't have time to take care of it. So I rely on plants and roses in particular that really are low maintenance. What you need to grow roses successfully is good rich soil, ample moisture, and full sun. There are a few roses that will tolerate a little bit of shade, but for the most part, roses really need full sun and they don't like to dry out. They also don't like a lot of heat and humidity, so you may find that your roses tend to flag a little bit in the summer, their leaves may turn a little yellow. Roses are susceptible to a number of um, pests, insect pests, whether it's aphids or Japanese beetles. They also can be pe pestered by um, fungus and mildew. But if you start with a sturdy rose, they'll shake these problems off. If you come back to my garden in, say, September, these roses won't be as perfect. The leaves will have some yellow. Um, they may have dropped some of their leaves. But to me, that's not a reason and not to grow them because the display is so beautiful. Now I'm standing beside another David Austin rose. This one is really spectacular. It's called Abraham Darby. And as you can see, the flowers are enormous. It's slightly fragrant. This also does reliably rebloom. One of the things that will keep your roses blooming is to deadhead them. This, this flower is about to go, so I'm just going to take it right off. This one is going to, and I'm going to take that one right off. Now, down the road, when this whole stem has finished blooming, I will cut it down to at least the first set of leaves that has five leaflets. That will produce another strong blooming stem. So one of the things to re really bear in mind is if you buy reblooming roses, it does help them if you deadhead them. You don't have to with some, and I'm going to show you some roses a little bit later on that really don't require deadheading, but with most roses, not only does it make them look nicer, but it encourages the bloom to come along faster. This is the last David Austin rose I want to show you. This one is called Chasing Georgia, and this is actually a climbing David Austin. Um, I actually didn't know that when I bought it um, and planted it in the garden, and it became very tall, so I moved it over to this arch where it happily climbs. I'm curious to see how tall it's going to get in this climate. 
This does rebloom as a climber, but not as heavily as the bush uh, David Austin roses do. Next to it is a single old-fashioned rose called Betty Pryor, and this is a shrub rose. This is a, reli a reliable rebloomer. It does sort of continue throughout the summer for me, though again, June is the heaviest bloom. And I like it because it's very low maintenance and it just has these pretty single flowers that are almost like a pink dogwood blossom. And I have a pair of them, one here and one on the other side. And if some of you watched one of my earlier shows this season, I showed you how to prune these roses in the spring, which is really most of the maintenance that I do for them is to give them a really heavy prune in the spring. Over here to my right is another climbing rose that's just coming into bloom. This is a classic, it's called New Dawn. It's a very strong grower and that one is about four years old. It will probably get twice that big. It's listed as a re-blooming rose. In my experience, late, late in the summer, early fall, it will throw a few blossoms, but it doesn't really, in my mind, I wouldn't call it a re-blooming rose because the additional bloom is not that showy. But it's worth it for just the amazing display that you get early in the season. And since we're talking about climbing roses, I want to show you a few more. So let's take a look over on the other side of the house. Most of the roses that you buy today are grafted. What that means is that the hybridizers use a common root stock, which is of a very sturdy rose, and they graft onto that whatever hybrid they're trying to sell. Now, this rose is an interesting case because this rose is actually produced by the root stock. This is not the rose I bought. I bought a different climbing rose which died to the ground and subsequently it started to regrow and what regrew was the root stock rose. So this is just, uh, I don't even know what it is, um, but it's very happy and so uh, even though I wouldn't normally have planted this color rose in this garden, it flowers for such a brief period of time that I've decided to leave it. Growing in with it is another little tea rose, little climbing tea rose. It's actually a pillar rose. And this rose um, is sort of being swamped by this more aggressive rose, so I don't know how long this one is going to last. But this one makes very sweet little rose buds that are more to the scale that I would have wanted um, when I first planted roses on this side of the house. This gorgeous rose is called Alchemist. And unlike almost all the other roses in my garden, this rose is not grafted. This is what's called an own root rose, which means that this rose is growing on its own roots, not on a grafted rootstock. The benefit to this is that own root roses tend to be hardier and they tend to recover quicker and better in the case of a very hard winter when they get killed down. If this rose gets killed to the ground, it will come up and be the same rose. Unlike the one I just showed you, this will never come up as a different kind of rose. This is a once blooming, old fashioned rose. It only does this once in the season and this is it, but it's well worth it. Now behind it is another climbing rose called Zephyrin Druin. This rose is growing on a graft, not on its own roots. And this is a really a terrific rose. It's a great climber. It does do a little bit of rebloom, not much. But one of the things that's really nice about it is its canes, or these stems, where I'm dragging my hand up and down, 
are nearly thornless. So if you're looking for a rose that is easy to handle, that you don't have to wear gloves to deal with, Zephyrin Druin is great. Now one thing you may be wondering is, well, these roses are beautiful, but where do I find them? Roses are one of the few plants that can be reliably mail ordered. And one of the things that's terrific about the internet is you can simply go online, type in the name of any rose you want, and a whole list of suppliers will come up and you can mail order the rose. What you'll get in the mail, generally either in the spring or the fall, is a small root system with three or four short cut down canes and that's what will grow into a bush like this. Um, you can also find them at different nurseries but if you're looking for something in particular uh, it really is helpful to be able to use the internet and simply mail order but you want to do that either in the spring or in the fall. If you're looking for a rose that really is foolproof, look for the knockouts. This is part of the knockout series of roses. In fact, this is the original one. And I have to say, the color is a bit bright for me, but I wanted to try these roses to see if they were really as simple and easy to grow and re-blooming as all the hype. And the truth is they are. This rose could not be easier. If you have a sunny spot and you want roses, this is a rose that's really impossible to beat. In fact, it's so popular that you can buy this rose at almost any of the box stores now. It comes in different colors. This is the original, which is sort of like a cherry red. I'm going to show you another one in a little bit that's a paler color. They also come in yellow and they come in white. And this is a rose that you don't have to deadhead and it will just keep sending up flowers in waves all summer long. I've had this blooming even after a light frost in the fall, so this is terrific. This is easy. This is the rose that I would say if you've never grown a rose in your life, grow this one and you'll be happy with the results. This rose will probably be familiar to a lot of people, particularly if you live in this area and go to the beach. This is a Rosa Rugosa hybrid. Rosa Rugosa is the Latin for the common beach rose that you see all along the shore um, in New England and sometimes even along the highway. This is a, again another super easy rose to grow. Any of the Rosa Rugosa hybrids are very easy. They're tough, they're disease resistant, they're pest resistant. This one has single flowers but they also come in doubles, they come in white, they come in different shades of pink, um, there's even a yellow. So if you live near the water and you have salt spray, um, they won't tolerate having a wave of ocean water roll over them. But if you live near the shore and you have salt spray or you have sandy soil, this is a great rose. Any of the Rosa Rugosa hybrids are terrific for that type of a situation. Earlier I mentioned that I would want to show you another variety of knockout roses and here they are. This is double pink knockout. What I like about this one versus the earlier rose I showed you was that to me this looks more like a classic rose, particularly when it's in bud. So it's as easy to grow as the original knockout, but as they've continued hybridizing them, they've bred them to look more like what we would call conventional roses, and, but they've retained the pest and disease resistance 
making them very easy to grow. And I just want to point out one other thing. These bearded irises tend to continue blooming right when the roses hit, which makes a terrific combination. People often ask me what's a nice plant to grow with roses, and I would say that bearded iris is a wonderful choice. This brilliant red rose is Rosa Robusta. I ordered it um, from a catalog that uh, features antique and old-fashioned roses. It can get to be enormous. There's three rose bushes here, which I sort of grow as one. It does repeat bloom. It has these large single flowers, which I think are really pretty, and really prominent sharp thorns. So this isn't a rose for everyone, but it is very easy to grow. It can be grown as a hedge. If you want to keep people out of your yard, plant a hedge of Rosa Robusta. No one will go through it. And um, you can maintain it at whatever size you want by pruning it down in the spring. This spring I pruned it quite hard because I wanted to maintain it at this height. And that's one thing to keep in mind with your roses. You really can control the size that they get to by how hard you prune them in the spring. And you shouldn't be afraid to prune your roses because they really benefit from strong, disciplined pruning. This is a classic white rose. It's called Iceberg. And this, like the Europeana roses that I showed you a little bit earlier, is a Floribunda. And you can see that this rose just grows beautifully. It has clusters of these sweet white flowers. It's again a very low maintenance rose. It's great for mass plantings. I actually planted one just to see how it would do. And I recently added three more so I can get a big mass of them. And this rose will repeat throughout the summer particularly if I keep it deadheaded. So this is a terrific white rose that is low maintenance and very easy to grow. This red rose is called Europeana. This is a Floribunda rose. Floribunda roses are a cross between a hybrid tea rose and a polyantha rose. Hybrid teas are the roses that you think of when you go to the floral shop to buy a dozen red roses on Valentine's Day. The polyantha roses are much sturdier and repeat bloom quicker. So the nice benefit to Floribunda roses is that you, they're a bit sturdier than hybrid teas, which quite frankly I don't have any success with and they uh, bloom with more frequency. One thing I want you to notice, and I don't know if you've noticed it as we've been walking through the garden, I tend to plant my roses in large groups. I don't usually plant just a single rose bush unless I'm doing a pair that's flanking a walkway or a single rose climbing over an arch. When I plant roses in the garden, I usually do large groups of roses because Puck really likes large groups of roses in his garden. This little rose bush is one of my new favorites. This is part of the Drift series of roses. This one is called Drift Coral, although it's really more of an orange. Um, and you can see it's just covered with flowers. There's three rose bushes here. Normally I would plant them about two feet apart, which is what these are. And this is a rose that, again, is super hardy. It is very easy to grow. It's great because it stays low and in bounds. So if you have a small garden or you want to edge a garden, this is a great uh, series of roses. They come in pink, they come in white, red, orange, coral, a number of different colors. I've been using them for clients quite a bit since they came on the market. And I've had great success with them. One thing you should know is that 
I don't really fertilize my roses. Uh, my soil is rich and I don't spray them much either. Every once in a while if I have an, an aphid infestation or something, I'll spray them a little bit. But I really try not to do much of anything to them. And so all these roses that you see in my garden really require minimal care. Well, Puck is anxious to go for a walk, so I think that brings us to the end of our segment on roses. I'm going to cut a few to bring into the house. These are what's left of my foray into growing tea roses, which was a little less than successful. A few of them wintered over, but not many of them did. So I've pretty much given up on tea roses, but with so many easy roses to grow with beautiful flowers, I don't really need tea roses, but still it's nice to have them for the occasional cut flower. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this segment on roses and I look forward to seeing you again next time on In the Garden.